last section in transition metals. So looking at catalysis, catalysis is increasing a chemical reaction using a catalyst. Okay, so we're going to be covering the, the fact that transition metals are regularly used as catalysts. We're going to be looking at why transition metals make good catalysts and what homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts are. This will lead into how they work and also how they can be poisoned. So catalysis, as I've said, that is the increase of a chemical reaction using a catalyst. Now, if we think back to the first PowerPoint about transition metals, we talked about the fact that they had different oxidation states, different oxidation numbers. Remember, those two phrases are interchangeable. OK, so we know that, diff that metals can have different oxidation numbers. For example, manganese, I think we came up with Mn2 positive on its own, but it existed as positive in one compound. We had seven positive for another and six positive for yet another compound that contained manganese. Now, these different oxidation states, that means the transition metal can provide alternative reaction pathways. These reaction pathways, as long as they've got a lower activation energy, will speed up the chemical reaction and therefore the substance is going to be a good catalyst. We're going to look at an example of a catalyst now. and We're going to look at the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and Rochelle salt. Now, we're going to use cobalt 2 chloride as a catalyst and it's pink in colour, solution's pink. The reaction needs to take place at about 50 degrees C, it doesn't work at room temperature. During the video clip they talk about, the girl talks about carbon dioxide being released. This comes from the, from the potassium sodium tartrate. So there are two types of catalysts. We've got our heterogeneous and our homogeneous catalyst. Our heterogeneous catalyst is in a different state from the reactants. One example being black manganese oxide powder, which helps with the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. You may have used that in second year. It's quite a messy experiment, but we add a black powder to a liquid. We produce, in the case of hydrogen peroxide, we produce oxygen gas, which you will be able to see coming off. A homogeneous catalyst is, and a good example of that is the experiment we've just looked at, the cobalt-2 ions and them being broken down, sorry, them being used to help break down hydrogen peroxide. Okay? In the reaction we looked at, as it said, we had our pink CO2 positive ions that were changed into CO3 positive ions during the reaction. And if you noticed at the end, it was no longer green, it went back to pink. OK, meaning at the end, there were CO2 positive ions present again. We're back to concentrating on heterogeneous catalysts here. We're seeing that or we know that catalyst will speed up a reaction because it provides an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. OK, so we're talking about heterogeneous. So we're looking at gas uh, reactions between gases and liquids. 
and the catalyst being a solid. Now, one thing we could consider, um, relate to this, a catalytic converter in a car. OK, and in the catalytic converter, you've got solid platinum metal or rubidium metal. And it reacts with the gases that are emitted from the engine. Gases like carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen. Okay. So what would happen is the gases would be attracted to sites on the surface of the catalyst and there would be bonds forming between the surface of the catalyst and the absorbed molecule. As this happens, the bonds within the absorbed molecule begin to weaken. Then what happens is another, if we're dealing with carbon monoxide, we'll say our one molecule of carbon monoxide has come along and it has been absorbed onto my platinum catalyst. This has encouraged the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen to weaken. They're still there, they're just weaker than what they are usually. What then happens is a second reactant molecule comes along. So another molecule of carbon monoxide would come along. It would collide with the absorbed particle. We know an absorbed particle already has weakened bonds. Therefore, it's going to be in a favourable position to react. Now, this collision, the second collision, is now more likely for a reaction to take place because of the original collision having now had, sorry, the living original collision causing bonds to weaken. The reaction will then take place and the new product will leave the catalyst surface. That means the site where that reaction took place is now vacant and another molecule of carbon monoxide could be absorbed. The next thing we're looking at is catalytic poisoning. And this happens when substances or impurities from the reactants are absorbed once it's surfaced. What they'll do is they'll take up the place on the catalyst where reactants would usually occupy. Because of this, it means that there are less spaces or less surface area and activity of the catalyst that can actually be used. It means parts of it are now useless. And this is known as catalytic poisoning. Now, if poisoning occurs, we want to be able to clean that catalyst so as we can use it again. They can be quite expensive, and certainly in industry when they're used, you definitely want to be able to regenerate them, which means clean them. This is usually done by heating the catalyst with a gas that will react with the impurity. If we go back to the example we used a minute ago, carbon monoxide from the car engine. I don't know if you remember, but Carbon monoxide is converted into carbon dioxide before it's released into the atmosphere. So when we're considering this, we could be saying that some of the carbon has been left behind on the catalyst as a poison. OK, but it is possible to clean carbon away just by heating it with air. So for catalytic cracking, what we could do is just use air and heat it up to burn off any carbon that's there and that will make that will regenerate the catalyst meaning all sites can be used again this bit is looking at what and why we use what catalysts actually do and why we use transition metals we already know that our transition metals can form a variable number of bonds because of the unoccupied or partially occupied d orbitals okay now, we also know that our d orbitals, electrons, are lost or gained when we're changing the oxidation number. OK, in one of the other slides, we were looking at iron. In fact, I think it was the first set of slides when we were looking at reduction in oxidation. And it was saying that iron, two positive, wasn't very stable because we had 60 electrons. And if they lost one, one more, they would have five, so we'd have the five unpaired electrons which is slightly, which is relatively stable or a favorable position to be in okay so it's telling us next that transition metals usually have a coordination number of four or five or six and they're comp and there is space for species to attach themselves to the transition metals in a compound which is a transition metal of of sorry in which the transition metal has a coordination number of four so basically, we're saying they're usually four, five or six. 
If we've got a complex that has a coordination number of four, that means other substances or other species would be able to attach it and the coordination number could change to five or six. Think about the ligands in this point, okay? Our catalyzed reaction will then take place. What we don't do is disrupt the other ligands, the one that were there originally. So the ones that gave a coordination number of four, they will stay the same, okay? But what will happen is the size and shape of these will help direct the actual reaction that's going ahead. When the particles that were reacting leave the catalyst, what we will find is it is unchanged at the end. So if we had four ligands already on it, they would still be there and they'd be in the same place they were before. 